The scripture reading this morning will be coming from Judges chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. Judges 6, 6, 12 through 16. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then all of this has happened to us? And there are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Good morning to all of you on this beautiful Sunday morning. We're grateful for the opportunity to assemble together today. Last hour to in our Bible study and in this hour now as we worship God together. And we're thankful to all who have led us in our worship up to this point. And we're thankful that you are here. A good number with us today as we turn our full attention towards God. As we do always, of course, but especially when we assemble together to worship. And we've been led such a great way up to this point. Today's lesson is going to be a two-part lesson. Uh, after I spent a little more time with the sermon decided that it was really too long to do in what we would normally consider one setting. So we will continue this evening with the power of one prayer, the power of one person, and the power of one hope. Thankful to Shane and his willingness to uh, give up this evening. This is our second Sunday uplift. Uh, but uh, he was willing uh, to wait uh, on his sermon this evening, and I'm grateful to him. Of course, once he was willing to work with me. We certainly got approval from our elders to do that, and they gave their approval. So today, instead of uplift this evening, it will be a two-part sermon, and I hope that you can be back at 5 p.m. as uh, we continue. You'll notice as we go throughout the lesson, though, that each point could be a sermon in of itself, and that's one reason that it's kind of a, a long sermon. Gideon had a mindset that I believe quite often we usually do, or at least I know that I do. The sermon this morning is not about Gideon. We're not going to remain in the text of Judges chapter 6. But I did want to begin here to remind us of this man who, when the Lord said, I have this job for you to do, I have something that you're going to do, something that you're going to accomplish. Gideon, like Moses... And like so many other people that we read about in the Bible, and again, I believe like what would be our own mindset quite often is, I, I can't do that. I'm just one person, and I'm even the least. I'm the least in this tribe. And so there is that of, I can't really accomplish anything. Maybe someone else can do it, but I, I can't accomplish it. You know, need to find someone else to do this. And if we're not careful, we'll allow that to hold us back from what we can accomplish and from all the, the good that we, we can do. What we're going to do today, this morning and this evening is I've selected five examples in the Bible. There are many others, no doubt, to show just how powerful one person can be, one prayer can be, one sermon can be. But we must begin with the most powerful Hebrews chapter 10, one death. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14, because this is where it all begins with the death of Jesus. Now you remember, as while you're turning to Hebrews chapter 10, I'll remind you that the Hebrews writer in this, in this letter, perhaps maybe even a sermon that was written down and delivered, that the Hebrews writer is trying to encourage these Christians in the first century, Hebrew Christians, to not go back into Judaism, whether it be in part or in whole. Now we know in a study of the New Testament 
that there were some who were trying to go back into Judaism in part, or at least hold on to parts of it and bring parts of it into New Testament Christianity, namely Acts 15 and circumcision. Okay, we're going, to, we're going to bring this over from the law of Moses. We're going to say that this is binding just as well. So the Hebrews writer is trying to get that across to them. Don't, don't bring any of it over. Under, understand what the word of God is, as you can see in this book. Also, though, there is perhaps that of don't abandon Christianity to go all the way back into Judaism. That which some would do. They would, would, would come out of Judaism, uh, serve God faithfully as Christians, but then for one reason or another, just go back into it. Go back into that way. If it is the case that this book was written in the late 60s A.D., you're kind of on the threshold of A.D. 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And you can see why this message of hope is so needed and important to those Hebrew Christians at that time. Look, we, we carry on, remain through, be faithful. Even though there's some bad things that's coming, don't give up. Don't leave. And in doing so, he's teaching us about Christ and how Christ is, his law is better. Uh, his, his priesthood is better. Certainly his death. Is better. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, notice what the Hebrews writer is talking about in this the power of this, this one, this one death. He says, For the law, what we would know is the old law, the law of Moses. The law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Now, we're not going to get into the details this morning in our sermon, but you cannot ever fully understand or appreciate the book of Hebrews without a willingness and a commitment to study the law of Moses. So you see, that kind of a, an examination if we really want to understand this book, then we must spend a lot of time in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So am I willing to put forth the effort to study those books? And now I have a better understanding of what's going in the book of Hebrews. He said in verse 2, talking about all of these sacrifices in the law of Moses. For then they would not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. It was God's system. It was God's way. And these sacrifices, and taking them, of course, to the priest, as you see, for a number of different reasons. Sometimes sin individually or as a family or as a congregation. Sometimes the sacrifices on birth, such as even Mary and Joseph offered their sacrifices at the temple in Luke 2 after the birth of Jesus. But what we're noticing here is the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus, the death of Jesus, would take away all of these other sacrifices and the need for, for blood being offered. Verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It served the purpose for a period, but ultimately they could not fully take it away. It, it all goes, for those living before the cross, it goes up to the cross. For we who are living after the cross, it goes back to the cross. In verse 5, therefore, when Jesus came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Not that they were wrong in making these sacrifices and offering. They were commanded to do so. But that, this is God's ultimate plan we see coming forth in Jesus. Previously, verse 8 saying, Sacrifice and offering, burn offerings, and offering for sin you did not desire, nor have pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, verse 9, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. You remember in the garden in Matthew 26, Jesus said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, and you can finish it, but your will be done. But notice verse 9. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. This is that continual theme throughout the book of Hebrews, the difference of the Testaments, the old and the new, the first and the second. When Jesus is dead with his death, did away with one to give us the other, the new Christian period of time. By that will, notice verse 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The power of one death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You think about the love that God has that he gave his son and Jesus gave his life. And this death, this sacrifice. And you and I still benefit from it today. He said in verse 11, notice, notice the language beginning in verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. All of this according to the last 1,500 years in the law of Moses, the tabernacle and then the temple. The priest having their work to do, offering these sacrifices. I know people have tried to come up with figures of how much blood would have been sacrificed through those years and might have a pretty good guess but there's no way really when you stop and think about it all of those sacrifices all of that blood through all of those years and yet this one sacrifice did what none of them could do the sacrifice of Jesus one death Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So you can see the similarities, but also the differences. The priests were standing, ministering daily, a continual thing. Jesus obviously is still at work in his church. He's the king of it. We're going to see as the lesson develops that he's still actively working in his church. But the, the point of this is not to say that he's done and he's just retired from anything to do but it is showing us that there never needs to be another bloodshed sacrifice Christ covered that part now we on our part have something to do this is true but Jesus has done his part and he sat down at the right hand of God verse 13 from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool for by one offering there you are again one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Think about what one death did. Think about what one death did. Here are just a few areas of what one death did. This one death was prompted by the greatest need in the history of the world. There was a need for this sacrifice. There was a need in doing it so we could be saved from our sins. He, he didn't do it for his own purpose. He's God. He's eternal. He has always been. There was nothing that he needed to do for his own purpose. But, but it was he, he, what the, the need that prompted it was, was look in a mirror. <laughs> look, look in a, that's the, you are the need. I am the need that prompted Jesus to come. And to give his life as a sacrifice for our sins. Think about the love that was proven by it. Take, if you will, and just kind of feel that part of it right at the base of your hand. Just kind of, just kind of feel right there for a moment. Put in a little pressure on it. Maybe go a little deeper without hurting yourself. Picture that spike clock nail piercing through your skin right there. Can you picture that? Can you feel it a little bit? All the way through. In one side, out the other. And the other one. The feet.
the love that was proven when nails and whips sharp objects literally ripped his skin in pieces the church that was purchased by this one sacrifice Paul told the elders from Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 it was purchased with his blood so many people say the church isn't important give me God and salvation but not the church that's the first sign of somebody who does not know the Bible that well or has not spent much time reading it you cannot read the Bible and come away with out seeing the importance of Christ gave his life, his blood to purchase what we can be members of today so we can be saved from our sins. The Lord's church is where salvation is, Ephesians 5.23. Think about the destiny that was prevented by it. We're, we're like aliens. Ephesians chapter 2, without hope in this world, without this sacrifice, without this one death, there's nothing we can do for our sins. And we are on a crash course to eternal hell. His death prevented that from being your eternity and my eternity if we choose to allow it. He's done his part. We must, do, we must do our part. And also the hope that was provided by it because of this. We, we now have a hope. We now have the hope that we'll talk about tonight that was provided. But let's now go to the book of Acts chapter 2 and notice one sermon. When you consider all of the sermons in the Bible, there are plenty. And there are a number that you could look at. But how could we not use this for our sermon today, as a part of our sermon today? The power of one sermon. Some of you might know similar stories to this. But I don't even know if Tori knows or not. Her great-grandmother heard one sermon in a gospel meeting. Learned what she needed to do. Became a Christian that night. And remained faithful for the rest of life. Never think that the next opportunity isn't important. Now that was a sermon from the pulpit. But it might be your sermon in passing. Of encouraging someone. Of teaching someone. Of inviting someone to church. That might be your sermon that you share with one person. That changes, again, that course, that destiny, that destination. Here you have in Acts chapter 2, the Pentecost day. The apostles are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Everything leads up to this point. Everything does. And then you have this great and powerful sermon. Peter is there, beginning in verse 14, giving a defense for what is going on. He says, this is what that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he begins preaching this powerful sermon in Jerusalem. This one sermon changes everything, as we're going to see. This one sermon begins this body of believers in Jerusalem. That which is our plea today. Let's just go back to the Jerusalem church. Let's go back to Acts 2. Let's just do it exactly the way they were doing it then. So we can just be who they were. Let's predate everything else that we've heard. Predate whatever uh, religious group it might be. Predate the Stone Campbell movement. Predate all of that. I appreciate that. But my faith isn't in it. My faith is in the Lord. The sermon preached in Acts 2. The church built then. Let's notice and get into Acts chapter 2. Beginning in verse 36, this sermon cut them 
in their hearts. Your, your translation might say pierced or pricked. In Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching this great sermon over and over. He's talking about the resurrection. And in verse 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Here, here is a sermon that was a gospel preacher preaching a gospel sermon. We must realize that the Bible message is sometimes hard. In the words of the pages, the, Bible, the message of the Bible sometimes cuts us. It will sometimes prick. It will sometimes pierce. That, that is what the Word of God does. And it's not an attack on us, but it's an attack on sin. And here's the thing, if we have sin in our lives, then it, the, the, the cut might be a little deeper. This, this one sermon, it cut them. It hurt them. Because Peter said, you crucified the Christ. You did this. You say, well, I didn't do that. I wasn't living then. Do we not read about how we crucify him afresh when we choose not to live faithfully? And that how we were enemies when we were in our sins? The Bible from time to time, whether reading it or hearing it, it should cut us. And if not, we, we, we need to go back and, 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 and view it as insert ourselves into the text and say, put me here. Put me, help, help me to Teach me what the Bible is teaching me. This one sermon cut them. Not all, as we're going to see. But for some, you see that change. And you see that they were converted. Now sometimes people will say, when it comes to verse 37, when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Sometimes people want to focus in on this one verse, on this one question and say, what were they asking? We don't, we don't know what they were asking. I would disagree. I would say the answer is in the answer. Same as in Acts chapter 9 when Saul of Tarsus said, Lord, what shall I do? The answer to what he was asking is in how the Lord answered him. The answer to the question that they were asking is given in verses 38 and 39. So when you continue to read the text, you can say they were asking, what shall we do to be saved? That's totally what they're asking. The answer is in the answer to what the question is. Yes. Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins or for the forgiveness of sins. These were those who were cut to their heart and hearing this sermon preached and now they're ready to be converted. Notice not just an outward appearance and change, but a conversion completely different from who they were becoming new people Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 making a change in life again the answer repent let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins or for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit notice that's the difference in the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the first four verses for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So it's not limited to just this group. For generations to come, it is there. And you might want to jot down in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. Because you'll notice again, he talks about when we were afar off, excuse me, chapter 2 and verse 13, talks about being afar off, aliens, Gentiles. So the conversion process, you see that they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins or for the forgiveness of sins. They were told what to do right then and right there. In verse 40, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. The King James says, save yourselves. God has done his part. We've noticed that up to verse 36. 
God sent his son. His son died. His son uh, gave himself as a sacrifice. He was resurrected. But now you must do your part to save yourself. If you go to heaven, it, it'll only be because of God and you. God has provided his part. You must respond faithfully. Again, if you're there, let me, let me ask you this. Insert yourself into the text. Let's, let's leave February the 11th, 2024. Take your mind back to Pentecost, Acts 2, Jerusalem at the temple. And you're hearing this sermon by the apostle Peter. Let's say you're the one that speaks up. Let's say you're the one that says, wait a minute, Peter. This, what you said, this hurts me. I'm, I'm hurt by it. I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't realize that. What, Peter, tell me, what should I do? And Peter says to you, repent and be baptized. What are you going to do right then and right there? You're there, Acts 2. This is the answer you're giving. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. What is your response going to be? Well, I'm a believer. I think that's enough. Well, baptism is just a show. Baptism is just to join a group of people. Are you going to try to argue it away in any way whatsoever? Or are you simply going to do what Peter said to do? I believe you would just do what Peter said to do. If you're cut to the heart and you're sincere and wanting to know what shall I do to be saved and you hear from Peter, repent and be baptized, you're going to repent and be baptized. You're already a believer. That's why you're in Jerusalem. You're already a believer. That's proven in that you're cut to the heart. You're already a believer. That's proven in that you're asking what to do to be saved. And then as a believer, you're told repent and be baptized. You're going to stop what you're doing right then and there and put on Christ in baptism. There should be no different fast forwarding some 2,000 years. What they were told to do then still applies to us today. They were converted. In verse 41... Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. That day, day, right then, they were added to them. This one sermon, some 3,000 are saved on that day. And they become Christians. Nothing more, nothing less. Simple New Testament Christians. They did not have to go throughout the temple in Jerusalem and ask one another, well, what type of Christian are you? Stop and think about that a moment. What, what type of Christian are you? That right there should send the warning flags going off everywhere. Where does the Bible talk about types of Christians? No. They're just, they're just I, was, I was baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. The Lord has saved me. The Lord has added me to his church. I am a Christian. There's nothing else. There's, that's because they weren't dealing with them what we're dealing with now. And all of these man-made ways that you cannot read about in here. And then people having to say, well, I'm a Christian and I belong to this group. I'm a Christian and I belong to this group or this group or that group. Why not belong to the Lord's group? Why, 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 not, why not just be a Christian? Why not just be what the Bible reveals? They were Christians. Now they're first called Christians later in Antioch, Acts chapter 11. But you see this description of the disciples of Christians. But they continued. In Acts chapter 2, some 3,000 put on Christ in baptism in verse 41 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and they had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. 
So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That helps explain verse 41. The Lord was adding to his church. But you see that it did not end at them repenting and being baptized. It began there. And now you see them continuing to be faithful in the worship and the work of the church. And the rest of the New Testament from this point forward would further develop the worship and the work of the church. You have it here in a condensed form. This is what they were doing in Jerusalem. But then you take the rest of the New Testament, these letters written to congregations and individuals to give greater detail. This is, let's say, your table of content, con contents. This is, your, this is your introduction to your book. This is what they were doing. Now we're going to read each chapter hereafter to learn a little, little more information ex about exactly what they were doing in the worship and the work of the church. But this one sermon, it cut their hearts. It cut them. It pricked them. It pierced them. They did not want to continue in it. They were converted. They changed. They repented. They were baptized. They were forgiven. And they remained faithful as Christians. There is power. And there's still power in that blood today you must realize that and we must all realize that have you come in contact with the saving power the blood of Christ the Bible clearly tells us how to do it we've just read it repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and then that powerful blood will continue to cleanse you as long as you're faithful we would love to help everyone in this room go to heaven Maybe you want to sit down with us and study the Bible in greater detail. We've, we always have time. And there's nothing that would take the place of that if you're ready to study. If you're ready to do like they did then and see Peter's answer, answer to your question. If you're ready now as a believer to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, we're ready. The water's ready. It's your decision. Put on Christ in baptism to rise and rejoice and be faithful. Or if you're ready... So you've already taken such steps, but one thing or another has led you away from the Lord. You say, it's time to come back. It's time to return. It's time to, to get on track again. Cut, let, the, let the gospel cut your heart. Come back to the Lord. Become faithful once again through penitence and prayer. If there's anything that we can do to help you to go to heaven, please come as we stand and as we sing.